Welcome to the NC Choices webinar series, Teaching Tools for Beginning Farmers, funded by the United States Department of Agriculture's Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Program. I'm Matt Poor, and I'm going to be presenting the module on beef cattle production management. This is one of seven modules offered in this webinar series. In this presentation, we'll talk about animal health and welfare of beef cattle. If you're interested in other resources offered by NC Choices, you can find out more on our website or on our YouTube channel. So um, again, uh, the, today's topic is managing health and animal welfare for beef cattle. And uh, these two topics are together because it's really hard to think about one without the other. Uh, in most cases, uh, good health in the animals uh, is a result of good animal welfare and husbandry. And it's kind of a lost art, but uh, we do need to be spending a lot of time with our animals, uh, observing them, their behavior, and trying to make them as comfortable in their environment as is possible. So when we start talking about trying to understand health and welfare, uh, this is the key to our efficient beef production, as I said, because uh, animals that are uh, in uh, good health and good welfare are productive and help us to have the highest quality products that we can coming out of our system and that's very important. So the first uh, major topic to think about is the Beef Quality Assurance Program. And so for, um, for those getting started in the, in the business, there is a very well established program at the national level that uh, discusses the important basics of how to care with animals for their health uh, and their welfare. And uh, it is a certification program. Producers are to take that training and become certified in uh, beef quality assurance. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. We talk about the basic animal needs in terms of their nutrition and other things uh, that they need like that. We'll talk a little bit about animal identification, uh, the need to establish a relationship with a veterinarian, uh, how you handle the animals uh, in your day-to-day -day moving them as well as when you get them up and and uh, process them with some kind of a, uh, of, a, of a vaccine or something like that. We'll talk a little about the vaccination program uh, approach. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about internal and external parasite control. And then finally, uh, culling and other management practices that we need to, uh, to be thinking about as we manage our, uh, our herd. So uh, first off, let's talk a little bit more about the Beef Quality Assurance Program, uh, widely known as BQA. Uh, it is um, a national certification program that uh, is administered by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. Uh, it includes a package of uh, care and husbandry practices that are recommended, uh, feedstuffs and, and some understanding of, of proper nutrition, uh, feed additives and medications, how they may or may not be used and, and so that you have a full understanding of that. Uh, processing uh, and treatment approaches and then also records that you might be keeping and also the management of injectable animal health products. Uh, this is really important because we know that whenever we inject something into an animal there can be some effects on the tissue, some tissue damage and that sort of thing. So we need to really be doing that very uh, very judiciously in, 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 uh, as we uh, work with the management of our animals. Now if we turn and we think about animal welfare and what the principles are of that, uh, first off we need to have facilities that uh, are uh, useful and safe for both us and the livestock. So that's one of the first thing. Uh, the, the pen, the fences uh, will all need to be uh, uh, good quality and, and restrain animals appropriately. And we'll talk about that when we talk about infrastructure in a future presentation. Uh, also proper shelter for the animals. Uh, this does not mean a barn that they can go up into, but a place where they can get out of the wind in the winter time, where they can get in the shade in the summertime, that sort of thing is very important. Uh, transportation and how we move them. One of the most stressful things we do at an animal is to make them go in a trailer and then haul them down the highway. And so uh, doing that in a safe and effective way is important for their welfare. Uh, training and education may be the most important thing because uh, we're usually um, uh, working with other people when we are working with our livestock. And so if the entire group of people does not understand the principles of low stress management, then um, someone can start whooping and hollering or beating on an animal and, uh, and that disrupts the whole process. So it's important that we train and educate our employees. 
Uh, breeding and genetics also comes into play. We'll talk a little bit about that. Castration and, and dehorning are other uh, traumatic events that we need to be uh, managing properly. Uh, we need to be identifying the animal so we know who we're working with and we can have a record of individual treatments for that animal. Uh, feeding and nutrition uh, is, uh, is critical in terms of maintaining the body condition or the, the fatness of the animal that we talked about in an earlier presentation on nutrition. Uh, and then handling sick or injured livestock. This becomes uh, potentially dangerous for us uh, and for the livestock as well as, um, uh, as uh, you know, they don't always move freely and sometimes they don't want to get up and we have to know how to handle that. And then finally, biosecurity. In this day and age, there are many foreign animal diseases around the world uh, that uh, travel on people's clothes and feet and can move from country to country. So uh, while there are protections against that, we need to be very careful that we uh, maintain a secure farm and know who visitors are, where they've been, and that they are uh, disinfecting uh, clothing and shoes before visiting farms. Now just a, a mention of animal identification because as a, a beginning farmer this is th something that you just need to know from the very start. Uh, it's best not to name your animals. You should have a, they should have a number. Something that you can put in a, a computer uh, record that can be sorted and, uh, and stored. And um, we, in, in a 2010 audit, uh, about 78% of the farmers say that they used individual identification. And, and for, uh, especially for smaller producers, you should definitely have permanent identification uh, and a temporary identification. So an ear tag, as shown in this uh, <coughs> picture, is a temporary identification. That can tear out of the ear. And so uh, the, the, the picture there, you see a tattoo uh, the B453 is the animal's number, the, the letter uh, indicating the year she was born, and then the numbers usually is the birth order on that farm. But that's the, that's the system that's used to identify the animal, and that is put in both with a permanent tattoo uh, in the ear as well as the ear tag. So if the ear tag's lost, all you have to do is look at the tattoo and write a new ear tag and, and replace that. So that's the way we would recommend uh, for all producers. And uh, in general, we recommend that you tag the calves at birth, uh, but understanding that you have to be very careful. Uh, ca some cows are very sensitive about their calves being, uh, being handled at birth, and so you have to just make sure that uh, you're well aware that uh, cows can become aggressive sometimes in that situation. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, dehorning and castration are uh, two of the most traumatic things that we, we, would, uh, we would have to encounter on a farm. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, bulls uh, on the market, young bulls, uh, have a discounted price and uh, people expect a steer uh, uh, and will pay more for that. And then cattle with horns, uh, especially sharp horns, will uh, sell for lower price simply because they do uh, bruise other animals and, and have to have those horns removed at some point. So. Um, uh, basically, we know that uh, the reasons for this uh, are that it's the bruising in the horns, but it's also the, from, the, um, from the bulls, the, uh, the meat is not as good a quality. So both of these procedures should be done before, the, uh, before 90 days of age. At that time, the horns are very small, uh, the testicles are very small, and it's not traumatic for the animal uh, as it is later. So, uh, so doing that as young an age as possible, and, and we uh, generally recommend 30 to uh, 30 to 60 days is a good time to do it, uh, but, uh, but again, take care of that early and, uh, and be aware that it is a stressful event. Uh, animal handling, I'll talk a little bit about this because this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have in the, in, in the beef industry. If, you, uh, if you're, you're, you're beginners, that's a, good, uh, that's a good position to be in. Uh, because as an experienced cattle person, you very likely got trained by someone who knew how to use a whip, a hot shot, uh, yelling, jumping, uh, all kinds of things. And, uh, and aggressive behavior is not good for animal handling. It can get the job done, but it's not good for the people or the animals that are in the process. So uh, this first uh, basic principle of animal handling basics, you do need a good working facility with uh, the secure sides and that sort of thing so that the animals uh, have to stay and, and have to go where you want them to go. 
Uh, cows and calves should be sorted before you start working them. Uh, again, these small calves can be injured by the larger cows accidentally, so get them separated and make it a lot easier. Uh, and then understand cow movement principles. When you step into a cow's flight zone, she will move away from you. And if you back away, she will stop. And so by going in and out of the flight zone, the animal can easily be steered in the direction you want them to go. If you remain in the flight zone, the cow runs. And then they become agitated and then you have a problem. So j calm, gentle, slow working works very, very well. Uh, you should never beat on animals. You should never whip animals. A hot shot is an electrical prod that may be useful in some situations in the chute where the animal does not want to move. But, uh, but that should be uh, at a rare minimum. And I'll just tell you my own personal farm, we do not own a hot shot and we probably will never have one again. Uh, simply because, uh, again, people that have come to help uh, see it laying there, they might grab it and, and start using it. And I don't want that to happen. Um, so in the end, when you are working cattle through uh, um, a chute to give them a shot, uh, you need to make sure that it is very smooth, easy, you don't have problems. If you have problems, there's a reason for it. And you can go back and analyze your system and look for a dangling chain or something like that that gets the animal's attention and keeps them from doing what you're trying to get them to do. So uh, it should be smooth and if it's not then there's something uh, really wrong with what's uh, what your system uh, is, is. So let's talk a little bit about more about those working facilities. You see a real common um, uh, style is the the curved chute uh, and curved pin with a sweep gate so that the animals enter uh, and, uh, and they enter the, the, the pen, the sweep gate uh, forces them into the chute, uh, and they walk in that narrow chute. Now, uh, well-designed facilities like that can really make it easy for you to, uh, to do the job uh, and with much less stress. Uh, one thing to think about, we do, if we have a wooden facility, we need to make sure that there's no nails that are popped out of the boards. Uh, you know, over time, these things age and you start getting situations where you can have some sharp objects. You need to inspect and make sure that those are, are, are not there. Uh, and we need to be able to restrain the animal. Now, that may be a head gate, as shown in one of these pictures, uh, for very gentle cattle. Uh, or it may be a squeeze chute, as shown in the bottom two pictures that actually, actually restrains the entire animal and, uh, and keeps them from moving. We do need to be able to use probably a squeeze chute if we're going to work on feet, if we've got one that's lame or has some other issue that, uh, that, that needs to be uh, worked on. So uh, the, one of the real important things about that when we're giving a shot, we need to make sure the animal doesn't move and is not jumping around because if you do that, you do more tissue damage. They need to be hold, held still. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the main reason that you need that restraint. Uh, this, uh, this next picture is, I guess, uh, one that I, I was uh, sort of proud to build and, and could take a picture of out of my barn. Uh, but you can see the elements of the lead-up pins uh, that, that come from a larger pin, uh, a, um, uh, a holding uh, pin with a sweep gate, and then the curved chute coming up to the head gate. Uh, this particular one uh, works really well. Uh, and uh, I will say that, uh, that there are other designs and, and, and there are other ways to do this. So if you need uh, to build this kind of a facility, make sure that you contact your extension agent uh, or somebody else to help you to design it. Uh, one of the, I'm going to go back and, and say one more thing about this. Uh, the most common mistake people make when building a working facility is to make the chute too wide. And if you think about it, the recommended width is 28 inches. And if you think about that, that's not very wide. How does a big cow get through that? Uh, but they can, they get through it, and then smaller animals will not turn around. So uh, that's the, the general recommendation. And, and if you make it 36 inches wide, because that looks a lot more comfortable for a cow, even a cow will turn around, and you'll find that out. So uh, believe the specs uh, when you get them. Now, just to change the subject a, a slight amount, you do need to have a veterinarian. Uh, everybody that owns animals has to have a relationship with a veterinarian. And uh, I, I wish that were the case, 
Uh, but we do need, you know, we, many people do not have a veterinarian. You need to have one. So uh, as a beginning producer, make sure you find a good veterinarian that will work for you. You have to develop a client veterinarian relationship with them. Uh, maybe they come out and do cases for you, or maybe you have them out for a consulting visit once a year or something like that. But uh, for them to be able to help you when you need a prescription drug, they have to know your operation, they have to know you, uh, and they have to have that established relationship. Uh, anytime you want to use a medicated feed additive, you have to uh, have them uh, to help you with that. And then when you have an emergency like a disease outbreak, you come home and you've got a dead cow and you don't know what to do, uh, it's nice to have somebody you can call that knows what they're doing. So uh, the other situation, if you're in a cow-calf uh, production, you will have a dystocia where you have a, a calving difficulty, a calf's hung up halfway out, and it's either you know get a veterinarian there or the cow will not survive. So, uh, so having that veterinarian for emergencies is critical. You also need a vaccination program. And uh, while uh, you know anybody can put one of these together with uh, non-prescription vaccines, you do need a veterinarian's advice because they understand diseases in your area and how to best prevent them. Uh, finally, a uh, very important thing is pregnancy checking. And we'll talk about, uh, uh, I think we already talked about that perhaps, but, uh, but pregnancy checking is a very important activity that the veterinarian can do for you. Uh, and, uh, and so you need, to, you need to be checking cows and making sure that they are in calf. Now, let's talk a minute about our <clears throat> vaccination program. Uh, the vaccination program is really a fundamental part of the health management program for the animals. The most important thing, probably, in my mind, is nutrition. And, uh, and, and this calm management. But beyond that, you need to protect them for specific diseases that are common in the area. Again, your veterinarian can help you to develop that. With calves, in general, we would uh, vaccinate for um, clostridial diseases. There's a vaccine called the seven way that uh, black leg is the common disease that we uh, are protecting against among, among several others. Uh, that needs to be given at three months of age to calves and then boosted later. Uh, there also is a need for respiratory vaccines. These are for respiratory viruses that can cause some big problems. So just before or after weaning, uh, we would give them a shot for diseases called IBR, PI3, BRSV, uh, and BVD. And those would be modified live uh, and, and, and would be given after weaning. Uh, and those are better than the killed vaccines that can be given earlier. But at any rate, uh, your veterinarian can give you advice on that. Um, our heifers, animals replacement uh, for the cow, animals taken in as replacements for the cows, uh, uh, they also have to get vaccination uh, for, for diseases that are reproductive diseases. Now you notice many of these are the same as the respiratory, so the, the respiratory viral diseases can also have some implications on, uh, on the heifer or on the cow as she is, is, is developing a fetus. So, um, so those again, IBR, PI3, BRSV, BVD. We also use a leptospirosis uh, vaccine, lepto5 and vibriosis uh, vaccine as well. And th those are usually packaged together in a one shot uh, approach. And, and again, um, get advice from your veterinarian on that. But we do need to make sure that that's at least 45 days or more before breeding uh, the animals. With cows, uh, same reproductive diseases we talked about with heifers, uh, although uh, there is some uh, use now of a killed vaccine rather than a modified live uh, for cows, that's becoming more and more common. Uh, or we need to give them modified live 40 day, 45 days prior to the breeding season, uh, and that's, uh, that's kind of a challenge. As far as uh, these injectable uh, vaccines, as well as any antibiotics we may be using in the animals, they need to be um, injected in the region shown in this slide in the neck. Uh, the, the reason for this is that that's a good place for absorption of these, uh, of these materials, but it's also a place for, where there's very low value um, meat, and so there's no, any, any tissue damage would not be a, a big problem in that area. So uh, we do want to try to use subcutaneous injection when that's uh, uh, labeled, when the product's labeled for that, and that's shown in that bottom um, 
uh, cartoon there where you pull the skin away and give that underneath the skin. Very easy to do. Um, and um, so we call that the tinting technique. Also, you need to be using the appropriate needles, either 16 or 18 gauge uh, will work. And we need to change needles frequently. Uh, this is one of those things that after about 10 animals, the needle's going to be so dull, you, you'll want to change it anyway. But again, back to biosecurity, there are diseases that can be passed from animal to animal through the needle. And so uh, the neat cost of a needle is about 15 cents. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me to reuse those needles. So at, at my place, again, we use all individual needles for every injection. Uh, back one more word on pregnancy testing. I mentioned that earlier, but uh, just to reinforce that, all cow-calf producers should preg test their cows. Um, keeping a cow that does not have a calf really is, is one of the biggest economic uh, detriments you could think of. Uh, it, this uh, knowing if they're pregnant allows you to call those animals that are not going to calve the next year. Uh, rectal palpation by the veterinarian is safe and uh, works well uh, uh, because you can estimate when the cow is going to calve. But again, quite expensive to get the vet out to do that. Uh, there's also a blood test as shown in the photo here uh, uh, called Bioprin. This, is a, this was really a breakthrough when this was developed. But you can take a blood test and then uh, send it in to this lab and, they'll, and then a veterinarian diagnoses the pregnancy, which is part of uh, veterinarian has to be involved in that decision. Uh, but you can take the samples yourself. We also can use ultrasound. Ultrasound is an advanced technique you'll find a lot in uh, purebred operations that want to know whether uh, a, a fetus is a male or a female, uh, but that can also determine the pregnancy date very, very closely uh, and, uh, and can get, uh, get you some good information to make some decisions early on. Now, a few other management um, considerations as we go through this. Uh, weaning management is one of the, again, one of the uh, critical things that you have to do if you have cows and calves. Uh, it's nice to say, well, I'm just going to let them naturally wean, but in many cases those calves will continue to nurse the cow for more than a year, and when she has another baby, that new baby needs the milk, not that year-old animal. So uh, getting the calves off the cow uh, is a very important thing, and we would recommend sometime between seven and nine months is probably the most uh, practical time to wean these animals. Um, it is a very stressful and it does reduce their immune response. We've done a fair bit of research with this. Uh, but preconditioning allows for calves to be transitioned to the next phase of their life cycle if it's done there on their home farm. And so that word preconditioning uh, is, uh, is means that you work with these calves, get them weaned, get them vaccinated, uh, and do that for at least 45 days. It's, it's really a very, uh, a very good system. Uh, fence line weaning is gaining popularity. This is where the calves and the cows are separated simply by a fence in different pastures. Uh, with electric fence, that's possible and it works quite well. But uh, as shown in this picture, weaning in a pen, as we've traditionally done, still does work quite well too and gives you the animals right there where you're with them, can teach them to eat from a bunk, can teach them the water, uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, there's a lot of ways of doing this. You just need to spend time with the animals and uh, encourage them to eat and spend time around them so they calm down because they are uh, in a stressful situation. Um, internal parasite management, uh, this is something that again, uh, uh, one of these basic things that we need to think about. Uh, animals uh, do become parasitized with worms, especially if you're in a close grazed pasture or animals that are, uh, that are fed hay and for long periods of time in the same area. Uh, and young animals are very prone to this as well. So they can get, uh, uh, as I say, worms. There's a few others. Uh, there's a protozoal, one called coccidia, and then there's a larger uh, uh, parasite called a liver fluke. We don't have many of those around here, but they can be in uh, farther south in swampy areas. So we use dewormers, uh, and uh, we should use them regularly on young animals but probably less so with adult animals. One of the problems with a lot of parasitism uh, that we deal with is people use too much of these materials and the animals and, and the, the, the worms or the parasites become immune to the, to the chemicals. And so uh, you don't want to use them any more than you have to. And so an adult animal is very resistant to these parasites. They clean it up on, with their own immune system. And so using the, the dewormers on the young animals and then leaving them off uh, for the most part the adult cows is the general recommendation. 
Uh, we need to make sure that we give the correct dose and that we do rotate that chemical family uh, occasionally so that uh, we're not using the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, coccidia, you need to understand coccidia are there all the time. They are an endemic um, uh, organism in, in, in the animal and uh, there are some things that we can use to control it. Uh, the ionophores, Remensin and Bovitec, both of those work well to control coccidia. But uh, if you control stress, they'll be all right. It usually when you have breaks is when animals are under stress. Again, liver flukes are rare in our region, but there are treatments that you can get that specifically target liver flukes, and you have to use that if that's what you have. So again, your veterinarian can, can tell you if you are prone to those or not. Now, along with internal parasites, we have to worry about external parasites, and these are the ones that are very obvious to us. Uh, flies uh, are a big problem uh, around uh, the, the, the cattle industry. We always have to deal with some flies. Uh, horn flies and face flies are the most problematic. Uh, if you're down in the coastal plain of, the, of, the, of this southeast region, uh, you won't have face flies, and so that's a very a big benefit. They are mostly in the Piedmont and the mountains of the eastern U.S., uh, and they, are, uh, they, they do really irritate the eyes of the animals. So uh, we do use uh, uh, insecticide ear tags, insecticide dust bags, back rubbers, uh, and all of those are options along with s directly spraying uh, insecticides on the animals. Uh, however, as with the internal parasites, resistance is real common. So the more you, at some point, the more you spray, the more flies you have, and it's really hard for people to understand that. But 100% uh, control is not practical. So if you're thinking you will have no flies at all, that may work for one year, but you will eventually have them and they'll be resistant to whatever you've been using. So we need to wait until the population is built up to the point where it's a problem and then we need to treat them effectively and get the population back down uh, and rotate our, our chemicals as we go through a, a given year. So um, uh, study that and think about that. One of the most difficult things that we have is to do that. Now, ear tags, insecticidal ear tags, they do work quite well for a year or two, but you have to rotate the chemicals. So there are systems that have been set up by most of the companies so that you can get ear tags that will control uh, these flies uh, pretty well. Now be aware that one of the keys to using a, an ear tag appropriately is to cut them out. They should be removed from the ear at the end of the fly season because if not, they continue to release a very low level of that pesticide into the environment and it builds the resistance in the population. So make sure that those are removed. Now the other one that you will have to do something about as well is lice. Lice are only a problem during the winter time they, they like the cooler temperatures and the long hair coats on the animals. And uh, lice uh, cause the animal to get really itchy and they scratch. And you'll see in this picture on the bottom, on this slide is a, a cow that has rubbed the hair off of her neck. And if you start seeing that in winter, it means that the cows have lice. Um, you can kill them at that point, but obviously that's gonna take a while for that hair to grow back. So don't wait until all the animals have this to, to treat for lice. Typically, we would treat in early winter, uh, in uh, late November, December, uh, and then come back and retreat if the product calls for that in a couple of weeks. And that's to get the ones that hatch out after the adults have been, uh, been removed. Now, one thing I will say, ivermectin type products, which is a dewormer that can be used to also give some fly control in some situations, is very effective on lice. So a, a use of ivermectin uh, at the uh, at an animal processing during December, January, something like that would really be something that would be perhaps remove, remove the lice for the rest of the winter. Uh, the next category would be ticks. There's a lot of increasing interest in ticks. We have a new tick called the Asian longhorn tick that is an emerging pest that has been a problem on some farms. And so we, we can't ignore that these are uh, issues. However, it's good to know that a good fly control program usually will control ticks. And so uh, if, you, if you're satisfied with your fly control, chances are uh, ticks are, are, are being controlled as well. Now finally, there's nuisance species. Uh, and these are very difficult to control in any way. Horse flies, deer flies uh, are, are a real problem. Stable flies uh, are also biting flies that you'll notice biting your ankles and that sort of thing. They can be controlled by hygiene, by cleaning up spilled feed, spilled hay, that sort of thing. That's where they, uh, that's why they're called stable flies. They breed in, in wet manure and, and, and hay piles. Horse flies and deer flies all 
um, are, are both of those are out in fields. Uh, they're very hard to control them, and um, you just have to live with them for the time of year that they're active. Um, finally, culling management. This is something that you need to be uh, be very uh, mindful of. Uh, that a good calling program can lead you to a younger, better quality herd. We do want to keep old cows. We become attached to them. But as they age, they are less productive. And then at some point, they die. And so as a farmer, you have to, be, you have to face the fact that you're going to have to bury that animal or in some way you know, take care of that. So it's, it's important for us to, to be practical about it and to market a, a cow before she is to the point where she's of no value to um, anybody. So it also allows us to improve genetics. As I said, it reduces on-farm death loss. Uh, uh, obviously, there's some cows that need to go to the market. Any mean or aggressive cows, and, and cows can turn. They can change halfway through their life and become aggressive. We need to make sure that they are, are not on the farm. Uh, the same way with bulls. Uh, we commonly will uh, call an open cow. Again, she's not going to be producing a calf and she's got value for the meat market, so she would be normally called and marketed. We also need to be looking at the teeth on cows. And so this, this photo shows uh, the, the looking at the teeth. And this is kind of a lost art, but you can look at the teeth of a cow and know how many years she's likely to remain productive. Uh, it's hard to tell how old they are because their teeth wear at different rates on different farms, but certainly you can say, this cow's got good teeth, she's going to be good for several more years. Uh, and so uh, everybody should learn to mouth their cows, and, and it's again a lost art. So to summarize, um, this particular uh, module on health and animal welfare is one of the most important things that we can, uh, we can think of in terms of our overall management. Uh, they, it deserves a lot of attention, and obviously I've stressed throughout that um, our image, our public image, depends on how well we care for our animals. And if someone's going down the road and they look and they see very thin cows, a cow limping or a cow laying down that can't get up, it's very, uh, it looks very bad on the beef industry and on you as a farmer. And so we need to be aware that we are, uh, we are very, um, we're being watched. Everybody is interested in how we take care of our animals, and we need to be sincere and do a good job of it. You need to have a veterinarian. There, there's just no way that you can uh, do good, complete management without having a relationship with a veterinarian. You need to learn to do as much of the processing yourself. So it's important to have a veterinarian, but it's also important for you to learn how to put an animal in a head gate, give them a shot, that sort of thing. I would not uh, recommend that you think about hiring all that out uh, to anybody. Um, develop a vaccination program specific for your farm. Make sure you have a good internal and external parasite program. And then think about both weaning and calling management as some of the general principles that you need to, uh, to be thinking about. Finally, uh, uh, back to where we started, I would strongly encourage you to look into the Beef Quality Assurance Program. Contact your uh, your extension agent, your veterinarian, uh, to talk about it. If you don't have a, um, a good extension program in your county, most of North Carolina we do, uh, but some other states and maybe a few counties, uh, you might not have access to a livestock agent. Uh, go to the National Cattlemen's Beef Association website and, and put up Beef Quality Assurance and you will find the national online program that you can get that training. Thank you.